Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my morning, pleasure everybody. today to introduce Grand Round speaker, Dr. Hillary Kenny from the University of Chicago. Dr. Kenny received her bachelor's degree in biology from Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland. She then received her PhD in neurobiology and physiology integrative sciences program at Northwestern University. In 2005, she began her postdoctoral research in ovarian cancer biology, studying tumor microenvironment and metastasis at the University of Chicago in the laboratory of Dr. Ernst Lengel. She's currently a research associate professor at the University of Chicago in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, where her research interests include organotypic three-dimensional models of ovarian cancer tumors, also the tumor microenvironment, and high-throughput screening of compounds to inhibit ovarian cancer metastasis. Today, her lecture is entitled Modeling the Ovarian Cancer Tumor Microenvironment to Understand the Biology and New Treatments for the Disease. Finally, I'd like to thank Dr. Kenny for agreeing to speak to our group today by Zoom instead of in person. And she's also agreed to allow faculty to contact her to set up additional calls or Zoom conferences after this lecture. Um, I'd like to make sure, I think usually Amy Olson says this, but that everybody has their uh, Zoom screens on mute. And if you want your videos going, that's okay. But I'm shutting mine off. So, Dr. Kenny. Thank you um, for the introduction and um, good morning, everyone. I hope I get to visit someday. Um, soon. I know my children were looking forward to a trip up there too. So um, as Amy had said, I'm going to talk to you today about the modeling that I've been doing for over um, 15 years um, to understand the biology and hopefully identify some new treatments or repurposing treatments for ovarian cancer. And I have um, nothing to disclose today. Make sure you said that. Sure. Okay. So I'm not Sure, how many are familiar with epithelial ovarian cancer, but it looks like the same story with most of the patients we actually see. Um, we don't know exactly when it is first um, occurs in the patient, but the patient um, presents with a high tumor load, usually undergoes surgery or new adjuvant chemotherapy and then surgery. You see a huge reduction in the amount of tumor and eventually um, within five years there is recurrence. In terms of approved treatments as first-line therapies for ovarian cancer over the years, and obviously this hasn't, doesn't include the last 15, um, it's mainly been um, platinum and platinum um, taxol combinations, um, just different avenues of delivery um, with IP. And I think a recent paper, paper came out that said how HIPAC is helping um, certain patients. And now um, we obviously have some PARP inhibitors but nothing that has been profound in um, resolving ovarian cancer or allowing women to live um, much longer lives with ovarian cancer in this case. And here's just an example of what I um, felt like I kept looking at when I first came here as a postdoc. And it was this trend of how, even though we're coming up with new combinations and new second line therapies for ovarian cancer and recently I've had you know a number of new FDA approved drugs um, but this is not changing much this uh, five year one year three year five year survival rate um, which really drove me to um, wonder what could we do to understand the biology of the disease and discover new treatments for ovarian cancer metastasis and one of the things that I immediately um, went into the surgery room with um, Dr. Langell or Ernst Langell, and he held up um, this giant um, five foot wide piece of momentum with tumors all over it in the surgery room. And just asking that simple question of why, why do they go here? And, you know, it's all over the peritoneal cavity. What's common about this? Um, so here I see, I show you um, the patterns of metastasis and you can see in the peritoneal cavity, whether ovarian cancer arises from the surface of the ovary or the surface of the fallopian tube or the peritoneum, it can disseminate, sloth off, disseminate across and carry by peritoneal fluid 
across all of these sur surfaces in the peritoneal um, cavity that are lined by mesothelium. And that is what is common to all the sites that are ovarian cancer metastasizes to. On the right, we just saw a gross picture of metastases here. You can see the bowel here on the peritoneum. And then here you can see tumor um, pretty much engulfing the bowel. But the reality check is that it doesn't really invade. Um, the only tissue that we really see this true invasion through the tissue is the omentum, which we'll get a picture of later. It, it, um, it's more like the tumor grows around these surfaces until it actually strangles the bowel, and, um, which is the majority of why patients um, succumb to the disease. And in terms of the metastatic cascade and the amount, um, the uh, functions that happen during this, um, we think of it as different steps. Whether they occur in this order, uh, you know, obviously, probably not, um, but in some way they do. Um, first, detachment from the fallopian tube or the ovary, dissemination and flow with peritoneal uh, fluid, adhesion to one of these mesothelium surfaces, which includes the diaphragm, um, invasion, which I have mentioned, and it doesn't seem to be deep invasion, but definitely invades some of the tissue, proliferation, and um, recruitment of new vasculature to feed the tumor. And we do see metastasis of ovarian cancer to other sites in the body. It's not that it, is, it never occurs, especially now that we have um, bevacizumab and a couple of other new treatments. They've seen some patients with different metastases, and it also commonly is carried by the lymph um, nodes to the surface around the lung and um, or the space around the lung, which actually has mesothelium also, which is very interesting um, in the floral cavity. So this is a picture of the main site of ovarian cancer metastasis. And at the top, it's just a gross picture of a benign omentum. And then we take a closer look. And you can clearly see when you take a really close look um, that we've got these large adipocytes, which look like big empty spaces from the lipids. Um, and then you see this layer of ECM. There are some fibroblasts. There's other cell types there too. Um, and then the basement membrane would be right underneath the mesothelia cells. And then the mesothelia cells are flat shaped right here. But they occur in typically in four um, morphologies. They can be cuboidal, flat, in between, and they undergo MMT, um, which we've um, become more aware of more recently um, in our publications. And then we look at the metastasis. So here you can see there is some fatty tissue, and then you can see these nice white hard nodules all over the omentum. Sometimes it's completely transformed that there's almost no fat left. I mean, it also depends on the patient um, with BMI comes larger numbers of adipocytes and larger adipocytes. So that also would change um, some of that dynamics. But here, when we look at the cross-section, we can see the early proliferation or presence of these um, large nuclei ovarian cancer cells. And then here over here, you can see the mesothelia cells to the left of it. You can take a closer look. But you do see that the mesothelia cells don't appear to be there, or maybe they're just underneath it. And then late proliferation and then early invasion. So here what I was talking about is you can clearly see that these cancer cells are invading and contacting these adipocytes one-on-one. -on -one. And in a previous publication from 2011, we showed how they, the adipocytes elegantly attract and sort of the macrophages um, by Kerry Rinker Schaefer with IL-6 and IL-8, those cancer cells right to the omentum within minutes of injecting them into the mouse in the context of um, experiments and um, homing assays in, um, in vitro. And then they actually undergo a dipogenesis, um, which is induced by the ovarian cancer cells. And the ovarian cancer cells uses these um, lipids as fuel um, to proliferate and so on for the metastasis. So one thing I want to always talk about or always mention, even though um, I don't show all of these today, is that I think one of the strengths that we can do in the science that we're doing because we have access to patient tissue and animal models is to, to use all of these models to understand um, the biology and to understand if these drugs are feasible. Um, because in today's world, um, we still are at a very, very, very low rate of um, success of compounds actually making it into the clinic. So the different systems we use are clinical collection. Obviously, I get primary tissue, the omentum to get cells. I'll talk about that. Um, we collect patient data. We collect cancer, normal patients, serum, you know, and so on. 
um, a different animal models and feature models and ex vivo models. And even though I'm not exhausting these of what we use, I just wanted to give a little picture of um, what we actually do. So um, Dr. Langell made in the second he walked into the University of Chicago a long time ago, um, and I wasn't far behind him, he developed this um, ovarian cancer tissue database. And this fake analysis is um, showing you that we keep all the, all the dyna or demographics of the patient, every time they come in, everything that's measured. And then we also, when we go in and um, make TMAs, um, we make TMAs of different sites of ovarian cancer tumors and different types of ovarian cancer tumors and normal tissue. And we'll go in and um, stain them for different um, proteins and then keep track of what the score is. Um, we've even gone now um, from epithelial to stroma location and so on. An example of this is, um, I published this a little while ago, is where we looked at fibronectin. Um, we found that fibronectin was induced by the cancer cells in the microenvironment as one of the early steps in metastasis. So we stained the TMAs for fibronectin. And what we basically found was that fibronectin was higher in the stroma, um, and particularly in the mental metastasis. And here you can see our classic IHC, and then our color deconvolution of the stroma. Um, we, there's an algorithm in a period that allows us to do this. It worked most of the time, but I had to check every single um, core of the TMA. And then the uh, color deconvolution for the tumor. So that's how we checked, is it actually tumor or stroma? It's actually analyzing and then automated analysis of it. And then we actually ended up having a pathologist score it too, just so we felt comfortable with the data. And even though this didn't really show us anything about fibronectin being associated with all the other demographics, like overall survival, progression-free survival, we did see this clear trend where um, there was more fibronectin in the omental metastases compared to the primary tumor. And this was not true for the, um, versus the peritoneum. But here we just confirmed that in different patients. Um, in the Western blood on the bottom, um, in this case, and then the normal momentum is um, in the second blood. So animal models, you know, ovarian cancer, there are some really nice transgenic models out there. We just unfortunately don't have them in-house here. We've been fortunate enough to work with some, um, the Mayo Clinic on PDX models, but the reality check is that there are a lot of different ovarian cancer cell lines that work well in uh, xenograft models of ovarian cancer and, and syngeneic. There's the ID8 and the, um, which is originally from Nellie Osberg and from the ovary, and then the um, HGS lines we now have, which uh, Fran Bockwell's group has developed, um, which we, we, have, we have not uh, fully grown them. It's only 16 weeks, so we're gonna see how that goes so we can have a full immune system in the mouse. Um, but we typically IP inject to look at metastasis or intraversal inject to try to mimic a primary tumor. But the reality is if even in, you're injecting in the ovary or the bursa, it's still getting to the peristeum immediately. But it is a little bit more of an aggressive model. Um, but the unfortunate part about all of this is that, you know, skv 3 ip ones and HAY8s, which work really reliably and robust in um, the xenograft model with, with athymic nude mice, they're not the most representative genetic and proteomic of ovarian cancer, high-grade serous ovarian cancer, which is what our main interest has been in this project. So those cells are not as you know, robust and reliable in vivo. So um, we've tried a number of methods, including irradiating the mice, which you know, obviously has its own consequences, but we use them all um, for what they are. Um, and yeah, we keep track of it. And I think we've had a couple of publications showing that, um, but always willing to talk to people if they're looking for something new. Um, but obviously using this model with others is what we wanna do. And then ex vivo models. So in the case of fibronectin story, we would take whole human omentum explants, co-culture them with fluorescent ovarian cancer cells, for a, a, a specific time, in this case, it was about, um, for RNA, it's about 24 hours, protein's about 72 hours, allow them to um, interact in the wells and then uh, basically detach the surface cells and the surface of the omentum um, and look at the expression of fibronectin in this case, as you can see on the right, um, there's more RNA or an increase in the RNA in the human omentum that was co-culture with cancer cells. And we always see this with condition media too. And then this is where, um, if you're looking at the unbound cancer cells or the bound, the omentum versus the unbound um, 
a mental cells versus the bound, you can clearly see that fibronectin was increased in them. Um, and then in vitro models. So this gets to what I've been actually working on for um, many years. So as I mentioned, the main site of ovarian cancer is the hemomensum, but the reality check is that all those peritoneal surfaces, whether it's the peritoneal wall, on the surface of the liver, and so on, um, or the bowel, they're all lined by mesothelium. And what I mean by that is, and here you see trichrome staining, so you see the cells nuclei in red, that they're lined by mesothelium cells, and under are ECM. I saw the and then you can see the adipocytes in the case of the omentum. In the peritoneum, these adipocytes are way down. Now we can see heightened ECM here, and um, the mesothelia cells are flat. You know, as I mentioned, they can be in four different morphologies, and this ECM can be a really, really thin layer that you've seen in some of the pictures. Um, but we mimic this in vitro to try to understand um, the biology, and then you'll see for high throughput screening. So this is a schematic of my 3D model where we plate ECM. We started with collagen one, rat tail, and um, eventually, because we found fibronectin be to be so important, we added um, human fibronectin to it. And it's really, really thin layer from majority of our assays, whether we're doing like adhesion and proliferation. But obviously, if we're doing invasion, we would add um, more ECM, and I'll talk about that. And then we cover it by a layer of mesothelia cells. And we try to use these at passage zero or one. So it would technically be pat, like we isolate them, they grow, and then we put them on. And then add the cancer cells on top. And whether, whether we're looking at adhesion, invasion, proliferation, um, secreted factors, uh, sort them and then look at the, um, the RNA or the protein. This is, um, has been our model um, throughout this time. So with the omentum we get right from the surgery room. It's only like 200 feet from us. It's in the building next door. And we walk over, and just in the saline solution, we get the mesothelia cells. We can see them cuboidal here, here in the phase contrast picture. And then we digest that um, with uh, a number of different things. So for optimizing, we do a lot of other things in between, get the SVF, get the adipocytes, and then do the fibroblasts um, with collagenase um, type 3. But collagenase type 3 has been the most effective digest. But you can also do a number of different ones like trypsin. And we made a, um, obviously this is my first paper on the model, but a medical student made a video of our isolation that's in JOVE, if you ever want to check it out. And we're always willing to share this and hope this model, or at least this idea of this model, would help someone else out um, with understanding their biology or, or their angle on um, whether it's ovarian cancer or other um, diseases. And then here's a picture of primary human ovarian cancer cells that we've isolated from a patient and grown on plastic. And this is a phase contrast image of that early adhesion of those cancer cells on. You can see these cuboidal mesothelia cells below, and then the, um, the cancer cells on top around it. So as I mentioned, sometimes we change the model a little bit to look at different questions and, and um, ask different questions and get different answers. So on the right, you can see an H, you can see E cross-section at 24 hours of the cancer cells invading. And obviously, we've provided them in a very thick gel in this context. So this is a uh, collagen-based gel in, um, in here. And the one thing I wanted to mention is we always allow the 3D culture, the music B cells, fibroblasts, to secrete their own ECMs, which they do very well, for 48 hours before we start an assay. Um, because we find that that's um, the most relevant for um, what we've been measuring so far, but I'm sure we can find other ways. And then these are different stainings um, for the Golgi, cell-cell um, interactions, polarization, which we don't see in the music cells. And this is showing you that the fibroblasts are still alive after um, 24 hours of the culture that we put in that manuscript. Um, and here's one of the uh, key experiments that we have used this organotypic mod model for, similar to the ex vivo, where we label the cancer cells fluorescently, can co culture them, and then sort them post, um, whether it's the whole 3D culture or just looking at the mesothelia cells or fibroblasts. And in this context, we were looking at how MMP, um, the MMPs were induced in the, um, in the uh, cancer cells upon interaction with the microenvironment. And you can see this at the protein level and then um, at MMP2 at the um, in real time PCR in this case. So next, 
um, I would say if I, in 2011, it actually was, we were fortunate enough to get an R21 um, when I was a postdoc that was building a model um, for the momentum for high throughput screening. And I thought, hey, we have a model. This is great. It's going to work really, really well. Um, it took me a long time to get it to a high throughput screen. Um, I went to a number of conferences. I just kept hearing these common phrases. Oh, cells, they don't like to be in smaller dishes. You're going to have to screen in 96 wells. Oh, no, I don't really have that many materials. I kept thinking in my head. But, you know, we moved along and we kept going. And I learned some really interesting tricks that are um, evident in my protocol. Um, but we found that, you know, you just be persistent and try to make it work. And we got it down. And you can see a schematic here. Once it sees the mesothelia cells, you can see they're a little bit more cuboidal in this picture. And here's an early um, ovarian cancer adhesion on top of the amentum. And you can see there's a really thin layer of ECM in these um, images of the human amentum metastasis and human amentum, as I mentioned before. And then in the middle is a schematic uh, of different uh, fluorescent labeled cells. So in the case of this picture, the fibroblasts are red, the mesothelia cells are blue, and the cancer cells are green. And you can just see it's a very thin layer. You know, maybe we shouldn't be using 3D, the idea of 3D, but it is somewhat three-dimensional. But the part that was um, the biggest factor in making this robust and reliable for high throughput screening was actually plating all the cells, not the ovarian cancer cells, at once. Because building that model and then all the steps that are involved in it led to a lot of variability. So one day in a meeting, someone said, why don't you just plate them at once? Oh, that's an excellent idea. So we plate them at once. And um, lo and behold, um, it became much more robust to the point where it actually could be approved um, to go to the next step um, and pair us with a screening center. Um, it was going to try to do this at their center. Um, and this is just a schematic of exactly how we read out. It's very basic in this high put throughput screen. The cells, the primary cells, the mesothelia cells and fibroblasts used at passage one um, are not labeled. The cancer cells are green. We use um, a GFP or we label with CMFDA for the 16 hour time point. It, it appears to be fine. I'm sure there's some issues with some compounds. That's why we do the, um, all these uh, confirmatory screens with GFP label cells um, or different um, fluorescence and then add the compound right after we add the cancer cells and then um, as you can see on the next page this is our protocol this is not a typical high throughput screening protocol usually they're about two three steps they are you know 0.8 and above Z prime factor but this is our protocol and we had modified this a little bit, um, which I, an assay that we've just been running for the past year, um, which I'm hoping that I can talk to everybody about in December. Um, but basically, we collate the 3D culture, we allow it to secrete its own ECMs, we just put it in a normal incubator, and then we add the cancer cells, we add the compounds immediately after the cancer cells. Key step, we just leave it on the top of the table for two hours. It allows the compound to dissipate evenly in those wells. And then this protocol is for a 1536 well. I do not do that here at the University of Chicago. We are set up, um, we have a small screening center for 384 wells, um, and they can do a 1536 and they're fully robotic, um, which makes it um, even more reliable and robust. Um, and then you, we wait for 16 hours in the incubator and then physically turn it upside down and put PBS in very gently, turn it upside down, put uh, formalin in, turn upside down, put PBS back in, and then it can be read right away in a year. You can check it out later and so on. Um, it kind of incorporated now looking at DAPI or, or nuclei staining because then we can see if the 3D culture is there or verify if it's there and it's not just the cancer cells in the 3D culture. Some key things when um, the cells are precious, like our primary ovarian cancer cells. Um, but that's our protocol. And then this is how we set up the 1536 well assay. Uh, column one would be you know, cancer cells, DMSO control, because all the compounds are in DMSO in the primary um, culture. T tomatine, we found, was one of the first uh, effective inhibitors of adhesion, even though it's um, an invasion, even though it is pretty cytotoxic. That's why we didn't follow it um, after that. And then the compounds, which 
the wonderful thing about 1536 is you can do them in four doses. So the performance of our assay, as you can see in the top Z prime factor, I mean, ideally you want this like in a, in a biochemical assay, it's like 0.8, but in a high throughput screen, 0.5 is very well resected. And you can see that ma majority of our plates were around 0.6. Obviously, we have some that are um, at 0.4, but still acceptable. And my 384 will assay, it's more down here between 0.4 and 0.6 in this context. And then the signal to background ratio is all, always well above um, because we choose um, cells that are bright um, in this case, and we're doing whole cells in this context. So this is um, one of the screens that I performed most recently, um, published this past year in MCT. and um, this one was on 40, about 45,000 compounds at once, um, which we can only do at NCATS, and the team at NCATS um, can do on the um, completely um, automated robotic system. So the primary screen was in the 1536 well, like I said, four doses. We found that 378 compounds, anything that inhibited um, we took, um, was, had some kind of inhibitory at a dose response, even if it was just the highest dose. Then we go back and do a confirmatory screen and counter screen there with 12 doses of those compounds and make sure that they're not cytotoxic in that 16 hours, um, killing the cells in 16 hours, but affecting adhesion and invasion in a dose dependent manner. And we did that with two different cell lines, HAY8 and SKV3FE1s. And then since HAY8 and SKV3FE1s are not the most representative ovarian cancer, high grade serous ovarian cancer cell lines, which we so, um, we found out at, after we started the screen, basically. Um, we took them back in-house. And in here at University of Chicago, in the 3D4 well, we did 12 doses with five high-grade serous ovarian cancer cells. And we took anything that was active in all five. We would do um, multiple assays with multiple microenvironments, um, so different patient samples. And if they were active in any of those patients, we moved them in the pipeline. And we only got eight um, compounds. So it was very doable to do the secondary assays. And that's when we step back, take the whole 3D culture and really look at, is this affecting just adhesion? Or is this affecting proliferation? Or is this affecting invasion? And we were able to do this in more of a high throughput way, which made it much, um, much simpler for us um, and didn't use as many resources um, in 384 well plates for adhesion and proliferation. And then we used 96 well Boyden chambers to do the invasion. In that case, I and mean, in that context, we use a little bit more ECM or collagen type 1 um, on the membrane before we plate the 3D culture and watch the cancer cells invade. And then we validate this in vivo. So we do exactly the same thing we do in the culture, but in the mouse. So 16 hours, collect, inject the cancer cells and the, and the compound, then um, take the omentum out 16 hours later, measure it by luciferase what the cancer cells are expressing or fluorescence and see how much is it here compared to DMSO control or another control compound. And then we led that out to see if that really led to a decrease in metastasis and survival. Yes, this is a prevention model, not, not, the, not the best model, but mimicking the, the, um, the high throughput screen. So the next test was to take an intervention study, treatment study, where we allow the tumors to grow, and then we treat with the compound for so many days or weeks, and then see if it affects metastasis, um, which allowed us to decipher all these different um, functions of what is, what, what they're function, uh, are targeting in terms of like, is it just adhesion invasion or is it proliferation and so on um, in this case. And obviously at the end, we only had three active compounds. So I'm gonna show you the results in, in the context of like the active compounds and then the ones that weren't, so you can see both of them. But this is the performance of the assay. And you can see this is the four doses we used in the 1536-well assay. And you can see um, here, down here would be activity um, or inhibition of adhesion. So obviously with the higher dose, you see more. So we did see some compounds. This right here, these uh, wells or columns in the uh, plates are tomatine, our positive control. You can see in each one, um, in this case, it's just showing you a, 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 um, a plate and the wells in a plate, just to give an example. And when we got done the first screen and the confirmatory, we um, saw with cluster analysis that we had a number of different active comp families of compounds that were active. 
But unfortunately, as you can see at the bottom, a lot of them were cytotoxic um, in this case. And when I say they're cytotoxic, the wonderful thing about NCATS having this screening center, they have run thousands of assays for a number of different diseases um, and functions bi biochemical, and they find that a lot of these compounds are cytotoxic. So that's where the cytotoxic is coming from this. But one group was not cytotoxic. Um, but ultimately, these cluster analysis and us pulling other compounds from it really didn't lead to um, anything that we were excited about, but we, we kept trying. Um, and then here's a direct comparison. So as I was mentioning, we measure adhesion and invasion. We're seeing here, and the red is the activity and inhibitory activity. And then the cytotoxicity um, counter screen that we measured um, in the same. And you can see that adhesion and invasion on the X and cytotoxicity on the Y, that they weren't directly correlated. Obviously, some were very cytotoxic, you can see in both, and they were eliminated. But luckily, um, the trend was not just killing everything um, in this assay. And this is just an example of the confirmatory screen that they ran there. And you can see we took anything that was active in at least one of the compounds. And these are the eight compounds on the three and the five um, that we followed. Um, so as I mentioned, we brought the compounds back to the University of Chicago, did the confirmatory screen. And these, um, this is a novel compound, we'll call it 7362. Um, PP1C1, um, which we'll find out um, or talk about later, um, mTOR inhibitor and milciclib, um, a cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor. Um, and these are the five cell lines we use, and these are the EC50s, and this is an example of that in the case. And then um, this is the confirmatory screen of the other five, which were active, um, another novel compound, and another, a number of different compounds. Um, which were active at the confirmatory screen level in, at University of Chicago. Then we took it one step further, as I mentioned, made that whole 3D culture with the ECM fibroblasts, mesothelial cells, and then looked at the cancer cells, how they adhered in the 3D for a while, or um, proliferated on top of those um, 3D cultures, or we put them on a voiding chamber in a 96 well and watched them invade. And with those, with three ovarian cancer cell lines, Kuramachi's, Avcar 5s, and Tick News, which we show here. Um, so here at the top is adhesion. We did four doses, invasion and proliferation. And basically, we felt like the compound should be active at one micromolar. Um, I know it really translates to what the cytotoxicity would be, but our cutoff was one micromolar. And that's why we found that these three compounds were active in at least two of these functional assays. Um, but the other five compounds were not in that context. Um, and allowed us to eliminate, um, by a process of elimination, um, eliminate them. But we still took them in vivo and did that adhesion invasion assay. As I mentioned, not the ideal, but we mixed the cancer cells and the compound right before we injected into the mouse 16 hours later, collected the omentum. In this case, we did luciferase uh, measurement that the cancer cells had, um, and these were ID8s um, in a syngenetic model, and F3 means that they did not have P53 that Ian McNeish made. And as we saw in vitro, the same trend was happening on the omentum, um, an inhibition of adhesion with these three. And the reality was actually four of the other five performed very well in vivo um, in this context too. Um, but we didn't take them further because they weren't active in two of the biological, at least two of the biological assays. And then we took it out to actual metastasis numbers. So we looked at the tumor number and the tumor weight after 55 days. Um, and they were effective um, or significantly inhibiting that. Nothing was different than another. And then took that sort of survival, once again, it prolonged survival, nothing significantly different between them um, when they're directly compared in that case. But obviously PP1C1 and uh, 7362 seem to be a, a little bit, um, I mean, 7362 and um, milciclib seem to be a little bit longer, but. Um, yeah, I keep saying it wrong, the orange and then gray. <laughs> um, but yeah, there was nothing significantly different. So then we took it to the intervention um, study. So here, what we do is we treat with the cancer cells. We made sure they had a mental metastasis a day, I think it's 25. And then we um, treated with the compound IP at five mg per kilogram. Um, and it was just looking in the literature, it was what seemed to be fine and comparable for PP1C1, even though the cyclic was reported at higher doses, and we just tried it with the novel compounds. 
We also have three compounds here that um, are inert or um, not as not active compounds that we found from all the screens that NCAS had done in the SAR analysis um, that we included in this context. And we can see that um, the 7362 seems to be the most effective, um, and, but it was not significantly different when directly compared to the PP121 or milciclib, but they all were effective at the intervention model also. Um, so once we had completed that, we knew that PP121 and milciclib already um, drugs already um, in the clinic or about to go into the clinic in some context, never really made it there, um, and that they, and their function in tyrosine kinase, as tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And there is this company, um, Kinactive, where um, they have these uh, proprietary probes which can bind the active site on these um, kinases. And in the context of your compound binding that site, which was de is depicted in the treated sample all the way at the bottom, um, it would uh, not allow the probe to bind. So when you perform mass spectrometry at the end, or they do, you clearly see a peak missing, um, and it would tell you that it's actually binding that particular um, kinase. And the way that they reported their results, um, and here's PP1C1, um, is in a dendrogram. Um, so you can see the potency of it, um, the concentration at which it's active, and um, potency um, here. And we can see that clearly um, mTOR is one of the main um, targets of PP1C1, and there are others um, which we are still um, exploring. But to take that one step further, we wanted to see if, because this was only done in tick mu cells. We wanted to take it one step further and see if this was really inhibiting um, phosphorylation of mTOR in Kuramachi's Alcar 5s and TICNUs, and it was in this context. Um, and then we looked at milciclib. Milciclib is much more promiscuous and has much more activity in many different um, proteins. And we focused um, at the highest on the CDKs in this context. And in particular, um, they signal through uh, or downstream of the CDK um, activity is phosphorylation of RB. So we took those three cell lines and looked at if they affected the phosphorylation of RB, and um, lo and behold, milciclib did at one micromolar in all three of these cell lines. Um, and then fortunately in our group, we, have, we had an amazing um, Dominic research analyst who went on to grad school already. Um, and is working on proteins now. We're able to perform SEPSA, so we do this thermal shift assay, intracellular, um, and tick news in this case. And you can see if the compound actually binds that particular protein you're looking it act at, it makes it more thermally stable, um, which you're seeing in the graph below um, depicted by this Western blot. So if we added increasing concentrations of milciclib, we could make CDK2 and CDK6 um, more stable, showing you that they directly interact, which was really nice to show another way in this case, which we could not um, get to work um, with uh, PP121 at all. We couldn't get any thermal shift um, assay to work for it, unfortunately. So next we took a look and, and said, okay, are, do they all have similar mechanisms of action? So if I look at milciclib, does it um, affect phosphorylation of mTOR or 7362? And they do not. And then the opposite, do PP121 and the novel compound affect um, phosphorylation of RB? And I'm just showing one dose here, but we've tried a number of different doses and they don't. Um, so knowing that we had a novel compound, we didn't know the target, we just a very, very simple um, gene expression analysis in Kuramachi is after 24 hour treatment, and that's five micromolar, I don't know why I wrote millimolar, um, treatment of, um, and looked at a number of different pathways. NF-kappa-B pathway, which is coming up a lot in that kinase, um, nessus and autophagy, a lot of similar pathways that are actually in my um, other natural compound that I've identified, beta S, which I've been working on for some time. Um, so we went through and looked at and validated some of these particular genes, such as IL-1 beta, RAC2, and MMP14, and saw that they were inhibited in all three ovarian cancer cell lines by RNA analysis and weren't by milciclib and pp one c one um, to give us some feeling for um, if this was doing something similar or different. And um, we're still exploring um, this novel compound. But the next great step we could do is we could go back to NCAS and say, 
do you have any, can you make or do you have any very close analogs to this compound? Can we find something that's much more potent or active? Um, so they went through and identified a number of them. And then, as I mentioned, in B, um, inert compounds, and we tested them. And we found that all five were active, that they chose all three of the inert did not affect adhesion and invasion in this case. And um, took it to the next step and looked at those independent um, assays, adhesion at the top, invasion on the left bottom, and proliferation on the right. And similarly, they all affected two of three, even though they weren't always the same um, biological assay in this case. And then we went and tested them in vivo, um, and they all worked at, on that initial adhesion and invasion. Um, and this one's bioluminescence on the left and the right um, in terms of that. And you can see on the right also, we have the three inert compounds that we tested that did not affect. And then we tried two other mTOR inhibitors, and they weren't effective either. So it was really interesting. I wonder um, if the mTOR has anything to do with the activity of PP121. And we've done some initial studies um, with inhibiting and with other compounds and knocking out, um, but I don't have anything new to report right now um, to validate that. And then we did that prevention, so letting it go out to metastasis. They all were effective, um, not really any, anything more than another, um, which in some way was very disappointing because that would have led us to think that there was some uh, validity in how to follow this new compound. Or So we still are talking to NCATS about it. Um, we actually have a compound um, in uh, the uh, pipelines, um, FDA pre-approval pipelines with them. Um, so we kind of have a plate full, but we're still thinking about that. And we're still thinking of some of the natural compounds that we've identified um, for moving along with um, in that context. So that is the, um, the summary of the 44,000 compound screen. But I also wanted just to quickly introduce um, what we have been working on with Abvi in the last um, almost two, two years now? Yeah, two years. So we, or I, had this, um, you know, goal of, could we just target all the cancer cells? Could we, could we stop adhesion and invasion of every single type of cancer cell? And then therapeutic-wise, I guess it was more thinking of as, as you go into the surgery and you um, debulk a patient, whether it's post-chemo or pre-chemo, that you could give them this drug and these cells could not bind and then the chemo would be even be more effective. Um, and even a, be be a bigger benefit would be if they affected proliferation and other things. Um, so my idea was that if we picked these ALDH or aldehyde um, um, high and low activities, we could encompass with all the other cell types, um, encompass more of the so-called stem cell population or non-stem cell population. And so our way of doing that would be to do an ALDH activity assay, label the cells that are high in ALDH activity or low, um, and then put them through the, combine them back together and color them differently, red and green, and then do the high throughput screen of 3D4 well with different compounds. Um, this time we were using um, known drugs in the clinic um, in this context, um, about 1400 um, or in the EU or so on in Australia. And then once again, do the same concept of washing, fixing, and then reading. And this time we definitely read the DAPI because we really needed to know how many cells were still there, if it was um, give us some insight on toxicity to the microenvironment also. Um, so yeah, so we've been working on this. And um, like I said, I hope I can report some nice findings. We've uh, got to confirmatory screens and now doing combinatorial screens between drugs and um, with carboplatin in particular um, right now. And then we'll go in vivo with these. Um, but what we did find out most interesting is we performed um, Cytoff analysis of all the so-called published or published stem cell markers that we could find, and there are 18 total that we tried, 14 to 18, um, depending on when it was analyzed, to see if they were in these ALDH lowered, ALDH high, and if they are present in the pre or post chemo patient ascites samples. They're all ovarian cancer cells we isolated were from ascites, and to our surprise, there was extreme variability. 
Um, it depended on the patient, depends on the cell line, um, what their stem cell markers are, and um, what leads to those stem-like properties like sphere, this in vitro sphere assay or in vivo tumor formation. Um, so yeah, we're trying to pick through that and validate some of that, get some mechanism in there, um, and hopefully um, report a story on this along with the screen that I think we still have some compounds that are very interesting. It just may have not been the best angle with the ALDH activity in the beginning, but maybe it'll be hopeful in the end. Um, and as I mentioned um, in the beginning, um, we are constantly changing and making new models for what we study. And I don't know if any of you are interested, but I highly encourage you if any of these models would help or if you want to protocols or anything, please. Um, we've looked at macrophages in the system. Um, cancer-associated fibroblasts. Right now we're looking at NK cells and T cells um, and um, collaborating with a number of, uh, uh, another company looking a little bit at CAR T cell activity. So there's always a way to shape it. Um, and then obviously um, organoids have, um, of ovarian cancer cells have come out, which are um, a beautiful model um, that we have tried but are not reliably doing here. Um, I'll tell you honestly, it's primary ovarian cancer cell growth for a long period of time and culture has not been our strength. We do a lot of short cultures um, and I guess it's because we're trying to stay as close to the patient, but um, we haven't been as um, effective at doing the long-term cultures. And then I'd like to thank everyone who worked on this. Um, obviously I, I co-direct the lab with Ernst Slangel, but um, yeah, he's my colleague and I've been working with him ever since I was a postdoc and um, we do all this research together. And then um, the, for all the funding from Abby, Bears Care has um, donated money to us um, for over 14 years, um, the, NI, the NCI and NIH for their R01 funding. Um, I'm also a recipient of the Ovarian Cancer Research Fund Alliance. Um, I'm actually one, one year and a, a month left, or just about a year left um, on that, looking at the role of the mesothelia cells um, in vivo in ovarian cancer metastasis. And then the team at NCATS um, in Rockville, Maryland, Mark Furrer is the head leader, Min Shen um, is the chemist and structural, Malou, um, who's not there anymore, she actually ran the assays, Juan is another chemist, and um, Kyle's also a chemist. And then the collaborators at University of Chicago, this screen was mainly between Dr. Langiel, Dr. Yamada, um, and myself, but now we have seven gynecologic oncologists, so we're very fortunate um, in terms of um, having access to patient samples um, and so on. And then in the screening center, uh, Sequan and Sarah played a huge role in this um, particular study, and Kristen is our biostatistician who always helps me. Um, and as Amy had mentioned, Anyone, um, thank you, and I'll take questions, but anyone's welcome to contact me um, via email, probably the easiest if you want to talk um, about anything or um, anything that you think that you want to try or collaborate on to or just have some uh, follow-up questions, I'd be um, happy to answer. And then this is a picture of the Chicago skyline um, in September um, with the teal. So thank you, and like I said, I'll take questions. Great. Okay. Well, I'd like to open it up to questions, if anyone has any questions. Hi, Amy. This is Leo. Um, thank you very much, Hillary, for this um, terrific talk. It, uh, for someone who's published over 100 papers on fibronectin and metastasis, it warms my heart. Uh, and it was very exciting to, to see your drug studies. Uh, if I go back in history, and this is probably buried in the tombs of some library, I worked with some people at uh, Salk Institute, and uh, we showed this, I mean, it's 35 years ago or something like that, that dexamethasone had an interesting effect and actually um, activated the promoter for fibronectin synthesis. So my question to you is, I'm sure it's been done, but I, I've been out of, unfortunately, doing research for too long. Uh, uh, ha has anybody looked at the role of steroid hormones of whatever type, estrogen or something like that, and um, uh, your model or uh, effect on ovarian cancer cells? So we've looked at a few. Um, 
with fibronectin, it's always led us to a, so it's interesting. It's not that it's completely independent of TGF beta um, or other growth factors, but we have kind of gone through and looked at different receptors um, for all of these growth factors. And obviously if there's an inhibitor available, we've used it or knocked it out. Um, <laughs> some reason the in terms of fibronectin like turning fibronectin on and, and the tgf beta r1 i don't know what it is and we have and we have we have been trying to find out what ligand or maybe it's ligand independent what ligand it's dependent on we actually thought it might be egf because it might be sequestering um when sequestering other receptors it's actually acting that way instead of directly through tgf beta r1 um but it blocks, like it completely blocks um, MMT and the MZP cells and everything. But I have not, yeah, haven't elucidated the mechanism yet. So I, I would like to go back to some of these papers. Maybe, maybe it's sitting there. <laughs> I don't know. But thank you very much. It was very, very interesting talk. Hi, Hilary. Nice talk. This is Lana. How are you? <laughs> Uh, I wonder about cells uh, you have been using because uh, there are different three kind of sets. And in regard to Karamuchi, we don't establish tumors in vivo. So I wonder how strong and good their metastasis capability at all. Yeah, so in terms of Karamuchi's, I, I totally agree with you. Um, we were just discussing this yesterday. So we, if we irradiate the mice, we can get the Kuramachis to take, but it's a very, very low take. It's really sad. Um, and, and as you know, it's not really an ideal model to, I think, irradiate. But um, no, we always are turning to the Opcar 3s, um, Opcar 4s, Opcar 8s, and COV3s as more of the representative of the class one and two, if you want to call it class one and two or group one and two. I like also of Sahu. Of Sahu, they establish nice tumors in vivo. They do? Yeah, they do. And, and, and do you mind me asking how, um, how long is that model? Oh, it's just like regular, just oh. same as A2780, same amount. Nice. I didn't know that. We haven't done that one. We're going to have to get, I know that they published um, Anivan Mitra and them, I don't know if you were on it. I don't think so. They published like one study where they did the models. I think we should probably, you know, I don't want to, we should probably get something out there that we can share that with other people too. Um, because I didn't even know that those took, they didn't look at those. Another question is the two very technical questions. When you sort LDH low and LDH high, it was red and green. Do you physically label them with red color and green color? Yeah, so obviously the high ones we label green with. And we actually just use, uh, what do you call them, the CMPTX and the CMFDA. Um, and what are those, the cell tracing um, dyes from molecular probes. Yeah. So we'll take the ALDH high and just label them with green. And then That's you that. are doing something during a, 48 hours and 16 hours. As per my experience, majority of high cells will be differentiated by then. Absolutely. Have a chance mm -hmm. to go to the very last end point and see how much of your green, which are LDH positive, are actually positive back then. Yes, and you're absolutely right. So the 16 hours, there doesn't seem to be much of a change, but there is um, because we take it depends on the cell. So if we find that they have 20% of their population is really high in ALDH, then we'll take the 20% low. Um, if it's only five, we take the five um, in that context and then mix them. But you're absolutely right. By three days, completely. They are completely profile. gone and you need to resort based on my experience. Yes. This is why this model needs some kind of improvement, you know, maybe potential dye which is shows LDH activity rather than just random dye which labels initial cells, yes? Yes. Uh, another thing, my question about uh, timing of adding drugs, because if this is preventive model, you have some kind of, you had some primary tumor, let's say you removed this, and then you are given this drug to 
prevent uh, metastasis. Yeah. If it is already existing metastasis and you want to, you know, stop even more spreading, so I don't see why you have to add drugs and cancer cells at the same time point. I was just mimicking the actual in vitro assays to see if it actually translated to in vivo action. And then obviously moved on to the intervention model. But yes, the intervention model is much more representative of something that can enter the clinic. Because the reality check is, we had a case yesterday for the first time that was a stage two in I don't know how many years. Like we always are getting widespread metastasis in most cases. Um, so you rarely catch a patient that, yeah as a primary tumor and no metastasis, so. And we're thinking of this as a combination therapy um, more than anything in that context. So hopefully we would be targeting you know, multiple mechanisms of either killing them or inhibiting proliferation or angiogenesis as well as um, those. But most of the, what's interesting is most of the compounds we're identifying as affecting adhesion and invasion. And we did some preliminary studies. Um, we are finding that targeting or drugs that target adhesion invasion actually are more effective um, at inhibiting stem cell population. Um, but that's as like a treatment. Um, so we're, we haven't you know, finished any of that, but that's why um, it kind of led us to look at the, the stem cells or all cells in that context. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I, I'd like to ask a quick question. Very nice talk, uh, Dr. Kenny. I really appreciated it. Um, are all mesothelial cells identical? And, and uh, is, is there any difference between the mesothelial cells lining the peritoneum and the uh, omentum versus the mesothelial cells lining the pleural cavity? So initial studies that we've done, and we haven't done this um, exhaustively in any context, the mesothelia cells that are on the peritoneum and the omentum, the thing, one thing we clearly see is that the mesothelia cells on the omentum, they have a totally different metabolic activity with the adipocytes being there. And they have a lot more macrophages. So their microenvironment is very different than the peritoneal. But when mm. we take them away and put them in the culture and some of the mechanisms of actions, like I, I can only attest to the fibronectin response or the MMP induction, they, those were similar but they definitely have different secreted factors. And we did some proteomic analysis and just looking at primary um, scrapes of mesothelia cells and then sorting by some markers, um, the proteomic profile was very different. Some of it suggested metabolic and some, some of it um, was more ECM based, but that's because it was proteomic. So I mean, that's what you get. You don't really get the signaling um, in that context. Um, so I'd say, yes, they, they are different. I don't know if they're intrinsically different. If you you trans, you know, move them because it, the omentum's function, which I still don't, you know, I don't think we all fully understand is, is um, stretching and healing other sites in the peritoneum and exchanging those mesothelia cells by touch um, to the surfaces that were, that need healed or were wounded um, in that context. So I think that they're um, somewhat interchanging, but they do, they are, they are different. And then the other um, location that we're very interested in is, so where the ovary attaches to the fallopian tube, you know, this little string, and there's this yeah. transition zone of mesothelial cells. Um, we, and that's why I always say, like, whether it originates in any of those populations, um, that's a transition site. And those mesothelial cells appear to behave very differently and are more stem-like. But I, I just very, like, just a few experiments. We, we, we really can't get to them and we really can't collect them now that um, it, the nice thing about is now they look at all of those sites um, in the patient when they remove them. So it's a question to be answered in terms of, you know, the initial transition. I'm sure they play a key, key role. Thank you. Thanks. 
I'd just like to ask uh, one last question before we have to go, which is uh, whenever you're doing these assays and you have like the adipocytes and mesothelial cells, are these always taken from ovarian cancer patients to make your assays or are they from normal patients? And no, so everything I showed you today is completely normal. So I'm always talking about like that initial communication back and forth and transition. So yes. The reality check is that we also do look at cancer. So a lot of, um, like some of the studies we've been doing, we'll look at, you know, obviously a different patient has normal MSM, but in an actual patient tumor, we'll have um, sometimes the opportunity to look at that tumor right next to the tumor and then further away from the tumor and look at the adipocytes. Um, in the one paper, um, Avir is looking um, at it, the, the adipocytes and their function at those three locations, calves um, and the fibroblasts Anubon has been looking at um, in the past. Um, and now we're looking at the immune cell population in those locations and we looked at macrophages and so on. But um, yeah, just from a surface right now. And then we're, uh, we're building in the model, the future models that we're building with um, T cells and, and other things that we're looking at activity of killing, those will be tumor microenvironments. Um, so in that context, it would be a totally different cell types because they'll be from a mental metastases um, in that case. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, well, I'd just like to, again, thank Dr. Kenny and everyone for attending this seminar. And if anyone has any further questions, feel free to email Dr. Kenny. She had her email address there on the last slide. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.